Hey, beautiful people, Brother Guerrero here. I wanted to share this video with you, this paper that Micah uh, wrote. And uh, I just wanted to share a partial of it. I do want to, you know, say thank you to his, what he, you know, the work that he's done. He did mention that we can use his work any way we like to. So I... <laughs> Wanted to go ahead and do that today with you. I, I uh, felt impressed to sh read this. And while reading, I'm like, wow, maybe I should share this. Because I know that some people don't watch his videos for whatever reason. And I figured maybe I can share it. I will leave a link below. Um, his videos are pretty long and that's probably one of the reasons why people don't have the time to do it but um hopefully you have at least 30 minutes of my time of your time uh to listen to what he has shared so let me just go ahead and read this okay uh it's the times of the gentiles chapter one and it says let me pose a hypothetical situation and question to you mothers who have Daughters, your daughter comes up to you. She has three boys she is interested in. She just, she doesn't know who the right one is. You as a mother don't like any of these three choices. You don't think any of these three is the right choice. Do you say to your daughter, A, daughter, those with the spirit will know the right one, or B, daughter, those with the spirit will know the right one when he comes along. Sherlock Holmes solved a mystery due to a dog not barking when he realized that the dog barked at everyone except for those he was familiar with, and there was no reported barking on the night of the incident. It wasn't evidence, but rather the lack of evidence that made things clear. Elder Bruce R. McConkie asked the question, does anyone know when the Lord will come? to New Jerusalem. Now remember the, the saints will know the will know the day and the hour of the Mount and Olives, as well as a great and dreadful day. Ergo, this quote from Elder McConkie must be talking about New Jerusalem, as it will be the only event that will sneak up on the saints. After asking the question, Elder McConkie answered it. As the day and the hour, no. As to the generation, yes. The saints, the children of light, those who can read the signs of the times, those who treasure up the Lord's word so they will not be deceived, will know the generation. Elder Bussar McConkie, when he said, wrote this, obviously thought that the generation could already be identified, which will become more and more apparent as I continue. The prophet Joseph Smith said, there are those of the rising generation who shall not taste death till Christ comes. This was said in 1843 of April 6. And Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, who would con constitute the rising generation? Quote, the rising generation is one of, that has just begun. Thus, technically, children born on April 6, 1843, will be the first members of that rising generation and all children born, however, many years later, to the same parents would still be members of the same rising generation. It is not unreasonable to suppose that many young men had babies at the time of this prophecy and also had other children as much as 50 or 75 years later, assuming, for instance, that they were married again to younger women. This very probable assumption would bring the date up to, say, the second decade in the 20th century, and the children so born would be members of that same rising generation of which the prophet spoke. Now, if these children live to the normal age of men, generally they would be alive well past the year 2000 
AD. So that rising generation would have entailed people born as late as 1920. What should you have noticed about these three quotes? They all had to do with the generation Joseph Smith said that some of the rising generation would be part of it. Not all and not even most, some. McConkey clarified that those born as late as 1920 would still constitute this generation. That would, that would mean that a, at least some born between 1915 through 1920 would live to see the Lord's second coming to New Jerusalem. This is also supported by this prophecy given by James E. Talmadge. Quote, the ten tribes shall come. They are not lost unto the Lord. They shall be brought forth as hath been predicted. And I say unto you, there are those now living, a, some here present, who shall live to read the records of the lost ten tribes of Israel, which shall be made one with the record of the Jews, or the Holy Bible, and the record of the Nephites, or the Book of Mormon, even as the Lord hath predicted. James E. Talmadge was not so much prophesying, but bearing his testimony of Joseph Smith's prophecy. Once again, some born between 1915 through 1920 will live to see New Jerusalem. We also have the quote from Wilford Woodruff, who said in 1873, but one thing is certain, though the Lord has not revealed the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man shall come, he has pointed out the generation and the signs predicted as the forerunners of that great event have begun to appear in the heavens and on the earth, and they will continue until all is con con consummated. Uh, and here are the references, guys. I'm not going to read the references. Um, maybe sometimes I will, but most of the time I won't. Wilford Woodruff says that the signs to point out the generation the major signs had already begun to move forward, once again confirming the timeline, post-1873, pre-Elder McConkie's quote. Remember the story of the mother and Sherlock Holmes I gave at the start. President Woodruff here, like the mother in the story, is saying when forerunners had begun, while McConkie did not. Now we need to answer what is this generation? What is this generation that we are trying to identify? Yes, it is the generation that will live to see Christ return in Jer New Jerusalem. But how do we know that? We know that because of Christ's prophecy regarding the generation in which the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Thus, we need to have an understanding of the times of the Gentiles and when they were fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles begin. The Doctrine and Covenants Student Manual, section 45, explains. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained that the times of the Gentiles commenced shortly after the death of our Redeemer. The Jews soon rejected the gospel and it was taken to the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles have continued from that time until now. The Lord said, but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. In that day, the gospel was given first to the Jews and then taken to the Gentiles. In this dispensation, it was taken first to the Gentiles and afterwards it will go to the Jews. The times of the Gentiles began with Peter's vision and the baptism of Cornelius. The fullness of the times of the Gentiles Moore and I, when visiting Joseph Smith as a young man, said the fullness of the Gentiles was soon to come in. In 1830, the Lord said, I have sent forth the fullness of my gospel by the hand of my servant Joseph. We know that Joseph ushered in the fullness of the gospel, and thus what Moore and I had told Joseph had come to fruition. The fullness of the times of the Gentiles was come in, or as Elijah declared, the time has fully come. 
The fullness of the gospel included celestial law, which contains in the law of consecration and celestial marriage. The times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. In Doctrine and Covenants section 45, we read verses 28 through 30. And when the times of the Gentiles is come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be fulfilled. It shall be the fullness of my gospel, but they receive it not, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In 3 Nephi chapter 16, verses 10 through 11, we read, And thus commandeth the Father that I should say unto you, at that day when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel and shall reject the fullness of my gospel and shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts above all nations and above all the people of the whole earth and shall be filled with all manner of lies and of deceits and of mischiefs and all manner of hypocrisy and murders and priestcrafts and whoredoms and of secret abominations and if it if they shall do all those things and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. And then will I remember my covenant, which I have made unto my people, O house of Israel. In these verses, we learn that the fullness of the Gentiles is to come in the fullness of the Gentiles is syn synonymous with the fullness of the Lord's gospel. However, the people rejected celestial law. They turned their hearts from it and began to be infiltrated by the precepts of men. And in that generation's lifetime, the times of the Gentiles was to be fulfilled. Doctrine and Covenants section 105 verses two through five, it reads, Behold, I say unto you, were it not for the transgression of my people, speaking concerning the church and not individuals, they might have been redeemed even now. But behold, they have not learned to be obedient to the things which I required at their hands, but are full of all manner of evil and do not impart of their substance as becometh saints to the poor and afflicted among them and are not united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom. And Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, verses 1 through 6. Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Joseph, that inasmuch as you have inquired of my hand to know and understand wherein, I, the Lord, justified my servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and also Moses, David, and Solomon, my servants, as touching the principles and doctrine of their having many wives and concubines. Behold, and lo, I am the Lord thy God, and will answer thee as touching this matter. Therefore, prepare thy heart to receive and obey the instructions which I am about to give unto you, for all those who have this law revealed unto them must obey the same. For behold, I reveal unto you a new and everlasting covenant. And if ye abide not the covenant, then are ye damned. For no one can reject this covenant and be permitted to enter into my glory. For all who will have a blessing at my hands shall abide the law, which was appointed for that blessing and the conditions thereof as were instituted from before the foundation of the world. And as pertaining to the new and everlasting covenant, it was instituted for the fullness of my glory. And he that receiveth a fullness thereof must all shall abide the law. Or he shall be damned, saith the Lord God. Lorenzo Snow, in April 5th, 1877, said, the principles of plural marriage were revealed for the benefit and exaltation of the children of men. 
but how much unhappiness has arisen from failure on the part of some who have contracted this order of marriage to conform to the laws that govern it but does but does it arise through any defect in the order of the marriage system oh no but from ignorance and the folly and wickedness of those individuals who enter into it who abuse rather than righteously obey it so in regard to the principles of the united order its principles to two are sacred and i assure you we will never go back to jackson county missouri there to build up a new jerusalem of the latter days until there is a perfect willingness on our part to conform to its rules and principles church history topic united order this is from the from ssls.org by the 1890s both the co cooperative institutions and united orders had either closed or transitioned into private business entities. Official Declaration 1, excerpts from three address, three address from President Woodruff, Wolford Woodruff, and it says, the question is this, which is the wisest course for the Latter-day Saints to pursue, to continue to attempt to practice plural marriage with the laws of the nation against it and the opposition of 60 million of people and the cost of the confis confiscation and loss of all temples and the stopping of all the ordinances therein, both the living and the dead and the imprisonment of the first presidency and the 12 and the heads of the families in the church and the confiscation of personal property of the people of all of which of themselves would stop the frac the practice or after doing and suffering what we have through our adherence to this principle to seize the practice and submit to the law and through doing so leave the prophets apostles and fathers at home so that they can instruct the people and attend to the duties of the church and also leave the temples in the hands of the saints so that they can attend the, to the ordinances of the gospel, both for the living and the dead. The Lord showed me by vision and revelation exactly what would take place if we did not stop this practice. If we had not stopped it, you would have had no use for any of men in this temple of Logan, for all ordinances would be stopped throughout the land of Zion. Confusion would reign throughout Israel and many men would be made prisoners. This trouble would have come upon the whole church and we should have been compelled to stop the practice. Now the question is whether it should be stopped in this manner or in the way the Lord has manifested to us and leave our prophets and apostles and fathers free men and the temples in the hands of the people so that the dead may be redeemed. A large number has already been delivered from the prison house in the spirit world by this people and shall the work go on or stop? This is the question I lay before the Latter-day Saints. You have to judge for yourselves. I want you to answer it for yourselves. I shall not answer it, but I say to you that that, that is exactly the condition we as people would have been in had we not taken the course we have. Close quote. The fullness of the gospel was available and President Wilford Woodruff asked a question and laid it before the Latter-day Saints and told them to judge for themselves and to answer it for themselves. The result was, or the answer to the question was ending the United Order and the practice of plural marriage, both in the 1890s. This is what Ezra Tab Benson said 
in 1974. God has to work through mortals and varying degrees of spiritual progress. Sometimes he temporarily grants to men their own wise requests in order that they might learn from their own sad experiences. Some refer to this as the Samuel principle. The children of Israel wanted a king like all the nations. The prophet Samuel was displeased and prayed to the Lord about it. The Lord responded by saying to Samuel, they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. The Lord told Samuel to warn the people of the consequences if they had a king. Samuel gave them the warning, but they still insisted on their king. So God gave them a king and let them suffer. They learned the hard way. God wanted it to be otherwise, but within certain bounds, he grants unto men according to their desires. Bad experiences are expensive school that only fools keep going to. Close quote. This is what John Taylor, uh, John Taylor's 1886 revelation. He said, quote, my son, John, you have asked me concerning the new and everlasting covenant how far it is binding upon my people. Thus saith the Lord, all commandments that I give must be obeyed by those calling themselves by my name unless they are revoked by me or by my authority. And how can I revoke an everlasting covenant? For I, the Lord, am everlasting and my everlasting covenant cannot be abrogated nor done away with, but they stand forever. Have I not given my word in great plainness on this subject, yet have not great numbers of my people been negligent in the observance of my law and the keeping of my commandments? And yet have I borne with them these many years and this because of their wickedness, because of the peerless times. And furthermore, it is more pleasing to me that men should use their free agency in regard to these matters. Nevertheless, I, the Lord, do not change, and my word and my covenants and my law do not. And as I have there, theretofore said to my servant Joseph, all those who would enter into my glory must, all sh must and shall obey my law. And have I not commanded men that if they were Abraham's seed and would enter into my glory, they must do the works of Abraham. And I have not revoked this law, nor will I, for it is everlasting. And those who will enter into my glory must obey the conditions thereof. Even so, amen. It was confirmed that this was written by the hand of President John Taylor. However, however President Grant, in an official statement, clarified that it was not a revelation binding on the church. Isaiah section, uh, chapter 50, verses 1 through 2 says, Yea, for thus saith the Lord, have I put thee away, or have I cast thee off forever? For thus saith the Lord, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? To whom have I put thee away, or to which of my creditors have I sold you? Yea, to whom have I sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourselves. And for your transgressions is your mother put away. Wherefore, when I came, there was no man. When I called, there was none to answer. O house of Israel, is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Old Testament student manual, uh, 17311 on Isaiah 50. Where is the bill of the mother's divorcement? The Lord employed the figure of, the, of a divorce and the sale of a slave to teach that thou Israel's past apostasy scattered them among the nations. The Lord had not set aside the original covenant he made with his people. Chapter 50 continues that theme begun in chapter 48 and 49, that in the last days Israel would be gathered and established again. Under Mosaic law, 
I, a man who divorced his wife, was required to give her a written bill of divorce. She was then free to marry again. Likewise, under the ancient laws, a man could sell himself or his children into slavery to satisfy his creditors. But the Lord had no creditors, neither had he divorced his wife. Israel, instead, Israel had separated herself from the Lord by her sins and was in debt to her evil creditors. For your iniquities have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressors, transgressions is your mother put away. But the Lord has power both to redeem Israel from their creditors and to forgive their transgressions against him. This he assured them he will do, speaking of the future as if it were already past. He reminded them that he tried to do so once before when he, Jehovah, came to earth as Jesus Christ. This statement is a Masonic passage since Jesus is both redeemer from sin and deliverer from evil ways. Yet when he appeared on earth, there was no man ready to receive him. When he called upon men to repent, there was none to answer. He gave his back to the smiters and did not his face from shame and spitting. Compare, oh. <laughs> but in spite of such rejection and treatment, he still did not divorce Israel or sell her as a slave. The covenant was still in effect and Israel would be restored to the status of a free and faithful wife of Jehovah. From what we learned in DNC 45, the generation that made that choice and or witnessed it would live to see the times of the Gentiles fulfilled. This would bring Wilford Woodruff's quote from the introduction into clearer view. <clears throat> and this was said in 1873, as you can see here. Both one thing is certain, though the Lord has not revealed the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man shall come. He has pointed out the generation and the signs predicted as the forerunners of the great event have begun to appear in the heavens and on the earth, and they will continue until all is cons consummated. So according to the Lord, those in 1890s would live to see the times of the Gentiles fulfilled. But how was a generation to know when they had witnessed the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled? Or in other words, what did the Lord mean when he said, and then will I remember my covenant, which I have made unto my people, O house of Israel? Knowing the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled is in Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, verses 12 through 16, and also on Luke 21. Let's read. Zion, a city reserved until a day of righteousness shall come, a day which was sought for by all holy men, and they found it not because of wickedness and abominations, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth but obtain a promise that they should find it and see it in their flesh. Wherefore, hearken, and I will reason with you. I will speak unto you and prophesy as unto men in old days, in days of old. And I will show him plainly as I showed it unto my disciples as I stood before them in the flesh and spake unto them, saying, as ye have asked me to, Asked of me concerning the signs of my coming in the day when I shall come in my glory in the clouds of heaven to fulfill the promises that I have made unto your fathers. What is the Lord referring to here? He is referring to the Olivet Discourse that he gave on the Mount of Olives, speaking with his disciples, in which he said in Luke 21, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them, with them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries 
enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon his, this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the Gentiles of the Ge until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Verily I say unto you, this generation, the generation when the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. DNC 4531. And there shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass until they shall see an overflowing scourge because of desolating sickness shall cover the land. It is important to note that the first scripture is from Doctrine and Covenants, the voice of the Lord written by the hand of Joseph Smith. The second scripture from Luke was also translated and verified by Joseph Smith. If this isn't correct, then it makes Jesus a liar, or at the very least, makes Joseph Smith a false prophet. In other words, we can't just brush this off. This is a serious prophecy. Another thing to note is that these passages make it impossible for members to create ambiguity of the Lord's words and or trying to twist them into something he is not saying that the Lord, that he's not saying, the Lord prefaced this saying, I will show it plainly. So once again, if you try to create ambiguity in his words, you are turning Jesus into a liar by saying what he said isn't what he meant, i.e. he didn't speak clearly and plainly. So what did the Lord plainly say here? Number one, Jerusalem would be trodden down and destroyed by the Gentiles. That's the desolation spoken by Daniel. And uh, number two, they would be trodden down and scattered of the Gentiles. Number three, the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Number four, Jerusalem will be returned into the hands of Judah. Number five, the generation in which the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled will will have men standing from that generation, which shall not all pass until they see a desolating sickness cover the land and see the coming of the Lord. Did the generation of men who rejected celestial law in the 1890s live to witness these things? President Joseph Fielding Smith said, as recorded in the DNC student manual, chapter 45, quote, Jerusalem will no longer be trodden down until the gen trodden down of the Gentiles. Again, President Smith explained, when we consider the words of the Savior to his disciples that the Jews should be scattered and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, we have a fair understanding of the meaning of this. In verse D DNC 4530, in this revelation, Jerusalem was trodden down of the Gentiles from the day of its destruction until the close of the year 1917, when it was freed from the Turkish rule by General Edmund H. Allenby and by and of the British forces, I'm sorry, of the British forces. After the war, Palestine became a British mandate and Great Britain by proclamation declared that country to be a refuge for the Jews who were invited to return. It is very significant, however, that Jerusalem is no longer trodden down by the Gentiles and the Jews are again gathering there. This is the sign given by our Lord for the end of the times of the Gentiles. We are now in the transition period and surely the day of the Jew will dawn and the gospel will be taken to them 
and the, to the remnants of, on this land. President Wilfred Woodruff said, the temple at Jerusalem was overthrown until not one stone was left upon another and the Jews have been scattered and trodden under the feet of the Gentiles now for 1800 years. And so they will remain until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that is pretty near. That's what I don't, it's, this was in general discourses when he said that. And then Elder Parley P. Pratt, in his book, A Voice of Warning, explained this crystal clear. Quote, during all this time of time, the Gentiles have pro uh, possessed the land of Canaan and trodden underfoot the holy city where their forefathers worshipped the Lord. Now, in this long captivity, the Jews have never lost sight of the promises respecting their return. Their eyes have watched and filled with longing for the day when they might possess again the, that blessed, blessed inheritance bequeathed to their forefathers when they might again rear their city and temple and reestablish their priesthood and worship as in the days of old. Indeed, they have made several attempts to return but were always frustrated in all their attempts, for it was un, an unalterable decree that Jerusalem should be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles should be fulfilled. Clearly, older prophets and apostles accepted the Lord's words and believed them. The Jews could not regain Jerusalem until after the times of the Gentiles was fulfilled, which is also reaffirmed in Joseph Smith's remarks above saying that the times were fulfilled, oh, Joseph Fielding Smith's remarks above saying that the times were fulfilled and we are now in a transitional period waiting for the times of the Gentiles to end, which will not occur until the Mount of Olives. But did the Jews re, uh, regain Jerusalem in a single year? No. The DNC Student Manual, 1981-2001, chapter 45, continues. And it says, <clears throat> when Joseph Philly Smith wrote those words in 1947, Israel had not yet been made a state. They were still under the British mandate. But on May 15, 1948, Israel became an independent nation and declared Jerusalem to be her capital. In the war that followed this declaration, the Jews could ma maintain control of Western Jerusalem only. East Jerusalem became part of the state of Jordan. In general conference in, in 1966, Elder Smith, now president of the Quorum of the Twelve said, Jesus said the Jews would be scattered among all nations and Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. The prophecy in section 45 verses 24 through 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants regarding the Jews was literally fulfilled. Jerusalem, which was trodden down by the Gentiles is no longer trodden down, but is made the home for the Jews. They are returning to Palestine and by this, we may know that the times of the Gentiles are near their close. That was said in 1966. It is, it is interesting to note, and the manual continues, that during the Six-Day War of 1967, Israel conquered the West Bank, including Jerusalem. And for the first time since the city fell to the legions of Titus in AD 70, Jerusalem came completely under the control of the Jewish government. So what do we plainly take away from this? Number one, the generation of the 1890s was told they would live to see the times of the Gentiles fulfilled. The Jews became no longer, that's number two, the Jews became no longer trodden down of Gentiles, 1917, at the earliest and 1967 at the latest. By virtue of this, the times of the Gentiles are now fulfilled 
no later than 1967. This is 27 through 77 years from the generation rejecting celestial law in the 1890s, clearly fulfilling that prophecy. Number three, there will be men standing in that generation that will not all die before they see a desolating sickness sweep the earth, not, and not all of that generation generally will pass before they see the second coming of the Lord, which is 1917 through 1967. Number four, the Savior will return during the lifetime of that generation, for if this generation all passes before the Lord's return, Christodom should rightfully collapse. So identifying the generation. We at this point in the time, and uncanny, I can never, I don't even know how to say that, amount of proof that the year 1917 is to start. Number one. Joseph Smith's prophecy of the rising generation, these born as late as 1920. Number two, the Lord telling us that the generation who rejects celestial law will live to see the times of the Gentiles fulfilled. The rejection took place in the 1890s. Number three, Elder Talmadge's prophecy of those born in 1917, living to see the 10 tribes in and their scripture. Number four, 1917, the Jews reclaimed their homeland, which was the sign of the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. There will be some born in the year 1917 that will live to see the 10 tribes return, as well as Christ come to New Jerusalem. Those born in 1917 became 103 years old in 2020. The oldest people living on earth today are around 115, meaning we are within the final 10 years until the 10 tribes return and Jesus appears to New Jerusalem. But obviously the generation was not everyone's born in a single year, nor was Jerusalem completely untrodden down to the Gentiles in a single year. There is a range, not coincidentally so, the Doctrine and Covenants a student manual teaches what happened 50 years later, a significant number of, of to the house of Israel, a jubilee. During the Six Day War of 1967, Israel conquered the West Bank, including Jerusalem, and for the first time since, the city fell to the legions of Titus in AD 70. Jerusalem came completely under control of the Jewish government. So this generation was anybody born between 1917 to 1967. Anybody born in 1917 through 1932 would constitute the old of that generation, or in other words, the sum mentioned. Anybody born between 1932 through 1952 would constitute the bulk of the generation or a lot or men standing from that generation. Those born between 1952 through 1967 would constitute the babies of that generation or almost all will live to see the fulfillment of all things. So we have already done the year with the old. So if you were to do the years of the bulk, you would have to work with the average life expectancy, not the oldest people alive. The average life expectancy expectancy in the USA is 78. In 35, 28 verses two through three, we learn that the age of man is 72, which means that the fulfillment of all these things should take place between the years 2010 through 2030. Looking at those years, what would that make 2020? The hinge point, President Nelson, uh, which he mentioned um, in January 2nd, 2020. The, uh, I guess you can find that in, in church news. The babies of that generation, those born between 1952 through 1967, most or almost all of them would, will live to see these events. This means these events 
have to take place well below the average life expectancy to make the numbers comfortably below the average life expectancy. <laughs> I've used 60 years of age and I believe to be fair using that it puts the no later than dates at 2012 through 2027, which is uh, even here, 1952 through 1967 plus 60. We are looking for a period of 14 years, which we will prove later in the series. But for now, let's simply just say that these 14 years are seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. This will become important as we continue to unfold this. The consensus of the data derived from prophecy is that the 10 tribes need to return and Jerusalem built somewhere no later than this time period. It is important here to identify no later than, although the time period for the great and dreadful day is set, the time period for the return of the 10 tribes building and building of the New Jerusalem and the Lord coming to New Jerusalem was not set even now. The fulfillment of these events is guaranteed. The generation that will get to redeem and build New Jerusalem is not. Joseph Smith's generation could have built it. Jesus could have been living with the saints for almost the last 200 years. That generation and every other subsequent generation has failed. Well, these are the words of Micah. Uh, you know, I, I always say, you, you know, you should look into it for yourself, do your own studying and, and see what you can get. There's more to this. Um, he talks about many other things, but uh, that's what I wanted to share with you guys um, before this gets really long. I, do, I don't want to make this video long, but yeah, I mean, everybody's talking about how close we must be. And I mean, this makes a lot of sense to me, but I always wondered where we were at when it comes to the times of the Gentiles, when will they be fulfilled? And there you are. The answer is pretty much here. All that you need to know is all here. So I'll leave a link below. You can see for yourself, check it out, watch his video, or uh, you can go onto this video in his video. And then there's a link below that you can go to that you can download this paper. All right. Thank you guys. Um, we'll hope to see you soon. Take care.